Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 2110. If you're joining us online, we're glad that you're with us. We are in a series, uh, The Joy of Christmas, and we're going to be looking over this series, this Advent series, where we're preparing for Christmas, looking towards that day, talking about joy and how we can have that in our lives. Uh, you know, God wants to bless us. He wants us to have, uh, like, open up heaven and just give us gifts, give us blessing. Sometimes I don't know if we really get that. We think somehow we have to like manipulate God or coerce him or try to convince him to, you know, give us a blessing. But what we see in scriptures that God wants to bless us. We certainly have to align ourselves though in a, such a way where we can, we're in a good place to receive what God has for us. And so that's certainly what we want to look at in the, in the series. And today specifically, we're going to talk about how uh, looking at the original Christmas story, we see that we can posture ourselves in a way where we're either kind of like in a bad spot to receive God's blessing or in a good spot. And this, uh, this is kind of uh, seen right out of the gate and in, in just setting the stage of the Christmas story. We have uh, somebody who's very proudful. And then somebody who's very humble. And so this is kind of the basis of, of preparing ourselves. We see that God resists the proud. So it's kind of like this story of contrast. You know, in the Christmas story, God resists the proud. And you see that First Peter 5.5, 5, that's the fill in the blank. God resists the proud. And uh, the proud person is Herod. We see, Notice, it's actually in both... Uh, Luke and Matthew, where the Christmas story is, is told. Those are the two places. And it, it says, I'm pulling from Matthew here. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the, the rule of King Herod of, Ju of Judea. That's so King Herod. Now, when Matthew was written and Luke, I mean, here it is. It's, it's 80 years after he was born or, or after he had died. People still knew who he was. That's why he, he pointed, hey, this is King Herod. Now, King Herod was born in 73 BC. He died in 4, B, in 4 AD. And, he, and his rule was 37 BC to all the way till when he died. And during that time, he was super, super uh, powerful, very influential. He, uh, was, he, he was a known as this amazing builder. I mean, he, would, he got all these architects together, city planners. He would build full cities. You can go into the Holy Land today and uh, you can find 10, 12 huge archaeological uh, sites still there with some of the amazing uh, structures that he built. So full cities, as I said. Let me give you uh, a couple examples here. Uh, one here is Caesarea uh, uh, Martima, which is right next to the ocean. And that's the amphitheater alone. There's a whole city there. Uh, they, uh, he was one of the first, he was the first one to use concrete under, underwater. So he had a whole big pier system, massive city that he had built uh, there in Israel. Then here's another one. He built a palace. This is a palace for himself. It's right, it's just a few miles south of Bethlehem. It's called uh, Herodium. And what he did was is he made a man-made mountain the size of a pyramid. And then on top of it built his palace. It's his winter palace. 
So he could go when he wanted to just go and chill. And, and it had um, all this incredible frescoes, all this stuff in there. And then uh, you may be familiar with Masada. Masada is his handiwork. And this is, it's down near the, be- the Dead Sea. It's kind of overlooking that. You see the whole Dead Sea. And there's different, well, you can see it in the background. And then, and then there's different levels of this palace. It's more of a fortress. And at the top, it's in the middle of the Sinai Desert, but at the top is this huge swimming pool and just spectacular views and spectacular structures. He also built the, uh, this, this Solomon's Temple and the whole Temple Mount. That's just, there's a Western Wall there that he is responsible for. Is that, is that up there, the Western Wall? Yeah, there it is. So that's, you may be familiar, people go and pray there. And... Um, uh, that's just one part of the wall, but the western wall, he, I mean, Solomon's temple, it was rebuilt a little bit after the, uh, the exile, after they had returned, but really it was, it was Herod who came in and rebuilt the whole thing, made a whole city around it, and like I said, these are just a few of the structures, but he was just, he was this incredible builder, a power broker, he was extraordinarily wealthy, but he was also a megalomaniac. A, paran- a paranoid megalomaniac. He was, uh, he was married, and then he realized that it would be better for him to be married to somebody else. Uh, it would be, uh, he'd have more influence, and uh, it was a power deal. So he ends up banishing his wife and his kid to another, for, to a foreign country. He ends up marrying this, this other woman and, and ends up falling in love with her. He starts to really love her, but then he, he becomes insanely jealous about her. And so he ends up thinking that she is having an affair and, and he ends up putting her to death. He's just, he's so consumed with jealousy. They had a couple of kids together. He, they, one, the oldest one would have been in line to take the throne eventually when he dies. But he starts thinking that they're going to, they're working against him. They're going to try to revolt and overthrow him. So he ends up putting his kids to death. Then there's another kid he has that, that, uh, uh, would take the throne eventually and 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 he's a fearful that he's gonna like overthrow his throne. so he ends up putting him to death but after he makes sure he he dies first and then he then he's put 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 to death and he, on the day of his he he makes a creed when the day he dies he wants to make sure people are mourning because so many people didn't like him because of the so he actually put a whole bunch of people to death the the, the day he died so that he would people would be mourning hopefully him the more popular one that you may be familiar with is found in the Bible. This happened about just a couple of years before he died. Some wise men come uh, looking for the Messiah. They come to him in, in Jerusalem and they say, where is the, 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 the king of the Jews who was born? Well, he thought he was king of the Jews. He was not really, though. He was Idumean, at least half Idumean, half Judean. The Romans had made him the king of the Jews. They may gave him that power, but he really wasn't the king of the Jews. So he's very threatened by that. And so these wise men, they say, well, and they leave. And then he asks his, his counsel. He says, where is the Messiah to be born? And they say, well, Bethlehem. And so you may know how that story goes in the Bible. He goes and he has, he sends his troops into Bethlehem and kills all of the baby boys that are two years old or younger because he's threatened. Hey, they might end up being king of the Jews. And I, I want that title. So he's this megalomaniac. He's paranoid, but he's also incredibly wealthy, very powerful. He's the most powerful person in that region. One of the most powerful people in all of the Roman Empire. And that kind of sets the, con- the, the, the beginning of the contrast. They say in the time of Herod, this guy with all this power, everybody knows him. And then it shifts focus to somebody who is extraordinarily a humble or lowly. And that would be the second. God blesses the humble. That's how we want to position ourselves. Peter says, God gives special blessings to those who are humble. So this goes rolls right into the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we then switch over to Luke's gospel here for that. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, 
the Lord is with you. Now, you know, who is Mary? Who is this, this, this woman, Mary? Well, we don't really know a whole lot about her. There's, there's some traditions that kind of start to uh, take hold in the early 2nd century and beyond, and, and some are more legendary. Some seem to have a lot of historical validity. Uh, one of those would be that, his, uh, that Mary's parents were Anne and Joachim. That was their names. But there was, there's not a whole lot we know about, about Mary. But we do know here that she is from Nazareth. That's significant. She's from Nazareth. What's up with Nazareth? Well, Nazareth, here, I have a map here to show you kind of where it's at. Uh, Jerusalem, as you can see down near the Dead Sea, that's Jerusalem. And then if you go 80 miles north, 20 miles west of the, of, of, uh, of the Sea of Galilee is Nazareth. Now, the capital of Galilee was Sepphoris, but Nazareth is right below that. Now, Nazareth is really just an, a, a, now currently, if you look it up on Google Maps, you'll see it's a sprawling city over this, over this hillside. Back then, it wasn't like that. It was very, very small. The large city was Sepphoris. That was the capital. And today, that's only an archaeological site. But back then, if you, if you were anybody, you were in Sepphoris. That's where the, the, the wealthy people live. That's where the powerful people live. That's where the people of, of, of notoriety live. And you can see that if you go into the, uh, even today, the, the ruins there, you see uh, these incredible villas that were there. The villas had just amazing living rooms uh, with, with frescoes and, and, and mosaics on the, on the, frescoes on the wall and mosaics on the, uh, intricate mosaics all over the floors. I mean, stuff you wouldn't see really in any of the homes in Virginia Beach, even the, even the wealthy people. I mean, this is just remarkable. And they had just incredible shops all along their streets and great theaters. Uh, the best schools were there. If you were anybody of anybody, you lived in Sepphoris, and that's where, that's where you came from. Now, Nazareth was a few miles away from that. That's where people, that's where like the servants lived who walked into town in order to clean the toilets of the people in Sepphoris. They would go there and they would clean their homes and they would maybe build them if they needed something built. Maybe some of the carpenters would live there and they would, they would, they would travel over. But, but Nazareth, in the list of cities, Nazareth wasn't even named. I mean, it was just like a bump in the road. It's just so small. And there was a lot of uh, poor people there. There was a lot of caves. That's one of the cheapest forms of housing is just to live in a cave. And this is where the angel Gabriel goes. He doesn't like go into Sepphoris where all the beautiful, wealthy, powerful people are. He goes to Nazareth. He goes to Nazareth and there he finds a young woman, her name is Mary. Now, Mary is, is a, a virgin. She's, she's pledged, though, to be married to Joseph, to this guy. So, so we know that she's young because women got, young, got married when they were young in that, that, that day. In the Roman Empire, you could get married as early as 10 years old. Generally, though, you didn't get married and start having children until you had your first period. So it was 12, 13, 14 years old, kind of in that range. And the reason why women got married so young is they died young. And they usually died of childbirth. The average age during this time for a woman's lifespan was about 35 years old. And they died in childbirth. Now, the likelihood of dying in childbirth was about 2%. That sounds pretty low. But women often had child after child after child. So every year and a half, two years, they'd have another child. And it was not uncommon to have 15, 20, 25 children all the way until you couldn't have children anymore. And so if you look at it that way, all of a sudden you see, well, no wonder so many of them died. Now, if you can make it past childbirth, then you would often live into your 60s or your 70s. But because of that, women got married very, very, very young. And so here Mary would have been, you know, this young girl, like 12, 13, maybe 14 years old, very, very young. The angel comes to her, and he singles her out. Here she is. She's pledged to be married, and, 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 and yet she's from this, this town that, nobody, you know, that nobody's special comes from. It's just it's like one stop sign or something, you know, in the town. And, and you might remember that uh, when Jesus is starting his ministry, somebody goes 
to Nathaniel, one of the disciples, or, and he was going to be a disciple, he says, hey, well, I found the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And his response, you might remember, is, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, it just made no sense to them. How could anything good come out of Nazareth? And so here the angel goes to this 13-year-old-ish uh, young girl, pledged to be married. From, she's a nobody from Nowheresville. And here's what she says. With that in mind, here's what, the, here's what the angel says. Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, if you have a Catholic background, you may know this as Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you, which is just another translation of that. Now, that, the angel comes and says, greetings, or hail, you know, hail. And, the, uh, and that, that word there actually is the same root word for joy. In other words, it's like you can be joyful. There's rejoice, Mary. And that's kind of the, the opening statement. Have joy, Mary. You're highly favored or full of grace. Again, that word actually is this real similar, same word. It's the same root word. So it could be full of joy. You are full of joy or you will be full of joy. Now, the angel might have been referring to the fact that she uh, is is going to have this this uh, special birth and she's going to be filled you know there's going to be joy with that or that knowing that she's in God's plan or she's so close to God in the flesh certainly all of those things could be part of that but here she, the angel saying you're going to be filled with joy there's going to be something there's something special that's unfolding in your life Mary and and certainly one of the things that we see is, is that when God chooses somebody he chooses somebody who often is not the person we would think. I mean, we would think if God's going to choose somebody, he's going to go get the valedictorian, the person who's killing it. doing. But often God chooses somebody who we wouldn't think to use that person at all. I mean, look at with, with Abraham and Sarah. They're elderly couple. They're in the retirement years. Anything that they would have done big, they would have done 30 years earlier. They're kind of like coasting now. They're retired. They're living on their pension. I mean, they're just... They're, and God comes to them and says, hey, I want you to do something great for me. And it involves giving birth, a miraculous birth, and, and all the great things God was going to do. And he starts then. That's usually when people are thinking, hey, I'm done. You have God choosing his covenant people. Who does he choose for his people? He finds a bunch of slaves. Because you're going to be my people. And then the person to help deliver those slaves out of Egypt, who does he find? He goes to Moses, who Moses was a fugitive from the law. Moses, Moses had a stuttering problem. Moses was a sh just a shepherder out in the middle of the Sinai desert working for his father-in-law. And God chooses him to be this great commander-in-chief to lead his people out of, out of slavery. When God chooses David, He's the king of Israel. He doesn't choose the strongest, the, 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 the tallest, the most handsome. No, he chooses the scrawny guy, the guy that's not even presented when, when Jesse presents all of his sons. Over and over and over, we see God chooses the unlikely person. And so that really brings it to us, right? If God's going to use me, you know, am I the best person? Well, if you're an unlikely person, you're probably the best person. If you'd say, well, I don't see God choosing me. I've got a lot of stuff. I've got a lot of baggage. I have a lot of weaknesses. I have a lot of flaws. I'm real busy. I don't know if God knows that, but I'm real busy. <laughs> then you're probably the right person for God to choose. He wants to use, he wants to use you. And he gets the glory. I mean, he's the one who chooses people from Nazareth. Because it really comes down to humility. You humble yourself before God. God, I'm willing to be used by you. This is what Mary was willing to do. Oh, you, you know, I'm, I don't know why you choose me, but hey, I'm honored. I'm humbled before you. Notice James says, humble yourselves before the Lord. And what? He will lift you up. Mary certainly is lowly. She's the humble person. So in this Christmas story, Mary receives this word from the angel that she's going to have the Christ child. And then she travels to Jerusalem right away. She decides, I'm headed out. This is like big news, and I'm not sure how to, you know, share it. So she goes down to see her, her aunt, Elizabeth. 
and she it's 80 miles down south here's another map so she goes she's up in nazareth she may go we don't know how she how what she does to prepare we're not sure if she goes on foot or with a caravan if she went with a caravan she probably would have gone this route regardless where she would have gone down uh the uh the uh, Jordan River and then back across to Jerusalem and then down there in 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 uh, in Karim, which is where Elizabeth and Zachariah live so she goes there to get encouragement from 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 Elizabeth because she's heard Elizabeth is pregnant in her older age so here it is this miraculous birth she's gonna have a miraculous birth she goes and she gets mentored and encouraged by Elizabeth now notice what it says here it says in those days Mary arose and went with haste she doesn't even tell her parents, as far as we know. She's just in haste into the hill country to the town in, Ju in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So she says, blessed are you among women, and blessed are the fruit of your womb. This is kind of peculiar, actually. Here she says, you, you're blessed, Mary, you're blessed. Now, Mary is blessed, but in our understanding, think about it. When somebody says, oh, you're so blessed, man, you are blessed. What are they normally saying? They're usually saying, you're living the good life, right? You got, you got money, you got a great job. You can travel, maybe you can travel the world. I mean, these are the things in our minds we think, you're blessed. This is certainly not what we see with Mary. Mary now, all of a sudden, she had wedding plans that are now going to be canceled and they're going a whole different direction. She is going to disappoint her family because she's, she's pregnant, she's not married. and Or she will be pregnant, she's not married. She's, uh, she could be in harm's way. Because the law said that if you got, if you, if you got pregnant and, and, and you weren't married, would, then you could actually be, you could be killed. Then she's going to watch her, 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 her son grow up. He's going to be different. She knows that. He's going to, maybe he's going to be isolated. Maybe he'll be picked on. As he gets older and he starts his ministry, he's going to be rebuffed by re, the religious leaders. They're actually going to condemn him. And she'll be standing there at the cross, at the foot of the cross, as her son is crucified. Now, what part of that, in our understanding, is that a blessing? I mean, that's not the term we use, right? We don't use, oh, you're just so blessed and, you know, when, when, when somebody's in a difficult time. And yet, certainly, this is what she's, what, what she's when she says yes to God, she is, it's going to get hard. It's going to get hard. So we should be careful, right? We should be thoughtful when we say, you know, you're blessed or we want to bless somebody. What we could be saying is, is I'm hoping you're going to be smack dab in the middle of God's will. And if that's true, it's probably going to be hard. But God's going to help you with that. Now, some of you, you, you don't, you know, you hear what I say. You talk about, oh yeah, I'd love to be in God's will. I'd love to be blessed in the way God wants to bless me. But you're just, you're not there. You're wondering, how do I take that next step? But listen, it's, you're not all, you're, it's not all about just you. You're part of a community. That's part of why, the, why God gives us the church. We do it together. Part of discovering God's plan for your life is doing it and it's a journey together. That's part of the reason we do step two. We do the growth track. Step two is today where you, you get to be part of that. You, sit, you, you, you start to figure out in the context of relationship, what's God's got? What, what's his plan for me? How am I, what, what, what's my next step? How am I supposed to receive God's real blessing, not just something I'm trying to manufacture? Because listen, it can get hard, often does get real difficult. God's blessing in your life, God's joy in your life is when you're in the in 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 God's when you're following his purpose for your life, when you're doing something bigger than yourself, and when you're experience God's grace and his peace in the midst of challenges. Some of you are there. Some of you are in a hard place. You're saying, hey, 
Andy, how long am I going to be here? I mean, what well, is a journey, certainly, but, you know, it's a journey to somewhere, and God is in the process of forming us and doing some great stuff. And there are ways that we can achieve joy even in our difficult place. I want to talk about that. Give you three. Primarily, the Bible gives you two ways. We're going to look at three. One that everybody knows. That'll, but before we do that, I want you to ponder for a moment and think. Of, I've asked the band to come and sing a song. It's about going through some challenging seasons in your life and allowing God to kind of speak into you, into your life in those places. Now, as, um, I'm, so I want you to stay seated. You don't need to sing along. This is, I just want you to let the words kind of cascade over you. Maybe you should close your eyes. If you're in a real particularly tough place, close your eyes. Just listen to the lyrics and let God speak to you through the song, okay? Like the frost on a rose Winter comes for us all Oh, how nature acquaints us With the nature of patience Like a seed Oh 
So sometimes there is a time of waiting and God works through that. But during that, we can still experience joy. I want to talk about three types of joy that we can have. Three sources of joy. One is kind of obvious, right? It's just joy from when good things happen, right? Good things happen to you, a pleasant feeling uh, that, that comes, the euphoria, you know, you have your baby's born, you get married, you, you know, you win the lottery, I don't know, whatever. I mean, you just, good things happen and you get promotion and, and that's easy. Everybody experiences that. But if, if joy is dependent upon the instant feeling that we get when only good things happen to us, it's going to be pretty fleeting. We're not going to have a lot of joy in our lives. So the, the Bible actually points to two other ways where joy comes. Uh, number one, well, it's number two, but uh, the first one is hope in God's deliverance. So God does delight in bringing deliverance. It, we're kind of in this dance, in this, in this journey, in this place where we get buffeted by the world and God's kind of like working his plan out and he loves to deliver us sometimes it's small deliverances sometimes it's big ones small deliverances like you get freed from an addiction you know what i've seen over the years that so somebody comes to christ and we come to christ especially the older we are but we come to christ and we have these different problems in our lives and addictions and 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 i've just seen this i don't have any bible verse for this but i've just seen it i mean so many times in people's lives that they come to christ and like one or two things it's like, are they're free from instantly. There's no struggle. It's just like they're free, boom, it's over. And, uh, and they've struggled often for years, if not their whole life. And then there's other things in their lives that it's going to be a struggle maybe for their whole life. It's just, and, but God's grace is there with them, and he's going to kind of work with them. And, 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 and that's happened to me. I mean, that's part of my story. You know, that there's some things I was just delivered immediately. Other things, I'm still working through them. I'm still working for it through them. It's, it's 35 years later and I'm still, I'm gaining victory. And getting, but, but so God gives us deliverance. Sometimes it's over some smaller things, sometimes big things. And he, and, and he loves to do that. And, and when that happens, that is a time to express joy. Now notice James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now I, that's like the like, least likely to be joyful when you have not just a trial, but he says, hey, look, you got a whole bunch. All of these problems coming your way. Woo! Well, God doesn't bring those trials. That's not what, it's, what he's saying. And, and, and we're not happy for the trials, but we are, and we have joy because we know God is at work through them. That there's something that, that, that we can pray for deliverance. And we know that in our past, that God's brought deliverance to us. And, he, and we know, can we have a hope and a joy that there's future deliverance coming our way? It's, it's part of what excites us about uh, when we get a hold of that. It's part of what brings us in prayer. See, if you don't, if you, if you don't really have an expectation that God's going to deliver you, your, your prayer life's going to suffer. It, it might be non-existent. I mean, why pray, right? It's just kind of like you're rolling the, 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 the dice anyways. Maybe God will help, maybe not, who knows? You know, but when we have a, a, a when we have a firm belief that God loves to deliver us, and He does it, and He'll do it time and time again, and part of our response to that is 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 in prayer. We look towards that. We long towards that. We move towards that. The psalmist in Psalm thirty is reflecting on things that he's gone through, many trials, over and over and over again, but God's also delivered over and over and over again. And as he's reflecting on that, he says, I quoted a few verses here, first in, in, the, in Psalm uh, 30, verse 5, he says, Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You know what? The worst thing in your life is never the last thing. You can think, man, this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. But listen, that is not the last thing because God brings joy in the morning. It may not be tomorrow morning. It might be, you know, a month from now or a year from now or who knows, maybe two or three or four or five years from now. I've, Sharon and I pastored, started this church 24 years ago, pastored the church the whole time, walking through 
uh, the lives of so many people that have gone through difficult times because that's part of life, right? I mean, you, I mean we've had people, had their, their kids die, young spouses die, autoimmune, chronic autoimmune immune diseases that deteriorate their body, uh, ALS, cancer, all kinds of things. Loss of finances, loss of a job, severe loss. And, and here's what I've discovered over the 24 years of walking through some of the darkest places with some of you is that God will eventually bring light. There'll be a day when you can smile again. That no matter, even if you've lost a child, even no matter how bad the loss is, there, God will break the clouds open and there will be a place where joy will break into your life once again. That's part of his promise. That's part of what the psalmist is talking about. He's saying, man, I've, went, I've gone through some of the most difficult stuff. Weeping. Notice what he says here a few verses down. He says, you change. He's talking to God. This is his prayer. He's saying, you change my mourning into dancing. You took off my funeral clothes and dressed me up in joy so that my whole being might sing praises to you and never stop. Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This is the kind of joy that God can give. This is the kind of joy that we're talking about. I mean, if you're already, if life is going great for, for you, that's, you're probably in a place of you're already feeling good, right? That's, you're in that first one we looked at. Life's going well, you know. But if you're in a different place, you're in a dark place, you need to know that God's joy can reach you when you place your hope firmly in God's deliverance. Okay, and then number three, knowing God will force good from any ad adversity that I go through. He forces good from any ad adversity, things that come my way, especially evil. Evil comes. God can take even evil things. He doesn't will that on us. He doesn't want, wish for evil, but evil is in the world. And so when evil comes our way, God can... He can work through that. He, somehow he, Martin Luther King Jr. said that God wrings good out of evil. He can take evil things and somehow he can bring good. It's, that's what we refer to as redemption. He redeems something, something that has no value or is bad. Notice in verse 28 of Romans 8, he says, and we know that in all things, God works for the, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. So we don't give thanks for, you know, for all things. He doesn't, God doesn't, it's not, it's not that we rejoice for the trials and the difficulties, but in all things, God's at work, working his will out and bringing, he's going to do some, something good out of it, he, no matter how evil it is. He, I mean, look at Jesus, one of the, that's probably the most evil thing that's ever happened. The son of God betrayed and then crucified scorned, despised. But Jesus had this joy he was looking forward to because he was going to redeem the world through it, through his sacrifice, what he was going to do. So it, it, it's, it's a perspective change. I see it differently. I think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was that, that leader in the Old Testament. He's helping the Jews rebuild their city after they've been in exile in Babylon. And they're, they're experiencing a lot of challenges. They're being, uh, their former neighbors now are like enemies. They're treating them terribly. They're threatening them. And he says, yeah, life is hard. But then here's what Nehemiah says. He says, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's where your strength will come from. That's what gets you through difficult times. That's when you know God's going to redeem this. I'm not sure how always. I don't get it. But at some point, he's going to reveal that. Paul said to the Thessalonians when they're undergoing hardship in their church, here's what he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So here he's saying that we're to rejoice always, even in the difficult times. Not, not for the difficult times, but in him, because God, we pray unceasingly, we stay before God in prayer, and then we just say, God, I believe you will redeem this. You'll bring good out of this. And you are my great deliverer. I want to end with this quote from Henry Nouwen. He once said this. He said, joy does not simply happen to us. 
It says we have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It's a choice. It, joy is something you choose for your life. Say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to walk in joy. Uh, there's a hope for deliverance. There's certainly believing that God will redeem. And God is at work in my life. And, 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 and God wants to bless us, but our blessing looks different, right? Uh, so when, when we think about the blessing that God gives us, it means being in the middle of God's will, which will often be hard. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. So let's just take a moment and posture ourselves so that we can be blessed. We can receive a blessing from God. Not arrogance, not pridefulness. We can do it on our, on our own. Anything that comes good our way, we're going to make it happen. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about humility. That really the real great things that happen, the greatest things that happen are things that God bestows. He blesses. And God wants to do something great in your life. He wants to use you. He wants to, he wants to bless you. And if you think that you're not a good candidate, then you're in the company of Mary and, and a whole bunch of other people that God has used. Abraham, Sarah, David, Moses, on and on. God wants to use you. Even with your weaknesses, even with your frustrations, your challenges. You know, when, one of the most challenging parts about not having joy in our life is usually in its place, we kind of have this hopelessness. We're not longing for God's redemption in our lives. We're not longing for God's deliverance. We certainly don't have the euphoria of good things happening to us in the moment. And so it's just kind of hopeless. hopelessness. My friend, let me tell you, there is a spirit of hopelessness. A spirit of hopelessness that if you are not careful, you can find yourselves just kind of swallowed up in that. And if that's you, I want to pray over you. I want to believe God's deliverance for you. You can step away from that. You can choose. I'm going to, and it's really a choice, but I'm going to pray over you first. Father, I just pray for each person here who's experiencing hopelessness, especially if it's because there's a spirit that's got a hold of them. So Lord, I break that in Jesus' name. Lord, we, we know there's power in the name of Jesus. And so we just proclaim the power and the love and the redemption of Jesus right now. Lord, I pray that anybody who is, has suicidal thoughts, thoughts of, of, of ending uh, a relationship with somebody, of, of, uh, of, of just kind of throwing in the towel on, 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 on a part of their life just because it's so difficult. Lord, I pray that, that you break them free from that. Give them in its place hope that you can do something that you're not done. You can wring good out of evil. You can de bring deliverance out of an addiction or any other thing. So Lord, I pray that, I pray that blessing. I pray that power. Now I'm going to invite you to pray. To step towards Christ. His will for you. Everybody, you can pray this. Say, Jesus Christ, I want to follow you today. He's right where you're at. You can just pray that if that's your heart. If it's not, then don't pray it. But I invite you to pray, Jesus Christ, I want to follow you today. I want to follow your will for my life. When it gets hard, I want to trust that you'll, bring my, you'll be my deliverer. Be my savior. Be my deliverer. We pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.